Great. Thank you. Uh, for very interesting talks. I actually had a uh, related question for each of you. So uh, I, I do uh, a lot of work on children's acquisition of uh, uh, endocentric compounds. Uh, so uh, things like, in fact, uh, a cup boat for a boat, boat that has uh, is made out of cups or is in the shape of a cup or something like this. Uh, we have languages like English uh, and German and Dutch where it's very free uh, to do this and it can apply uh, recursively. We can get uh, uh, faculty, lab space committee, all these things. We have other languages that don't allow uh, this type of uh, uh, compound. It just does a creative process in the Germanic way, uh, like French and Italian and Spanish. Uh, so, uh, uh, so this actually brings up uh, 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 a point for each of your talks. In the case of uh, Alina's talk, uh, I, the, uh, the cup boat thing was a, kind of a distraction, but I'd be fascinated to know uh, what is going on in the kind of composition uh, that applies in a language like English, where we do, in context, where if we're in a right context, uh, come up with a suitable meaning for cup boat. I mentioned that uh, Angelica Katza has been looking at this and uh, in some recent work suggested that it's a somewhat special type of semantic composition. Uh, in many cases, she thinks functional heads are involved in functional composition, but it, she believes that the functional heads are not present in, in endocentric compounds and that this is something different. And actually, Ray Jackendorf has also uh, suggested that and even suggested that, that that type of composition might be evolutionarily prior to some, some of the other things we find. Uh, uh, so so just, just, just would be very interesting to see if there were any different localization for that kind of semantic composition than for the kinds you looked at. And for Rizzi, for Ligi, uh, the issue is uh, if uh, people like Angelica are right, many people are saying that there aren't functional hits involved in bare root compounds um, uh, in languages like English. Uh, is this still amenable to your localization and parameterization in functional heads? And I guess we can always put a posit to say that the morphologists are wrong and that we do have a functional head here, there. I would suggest from my work on acquisition that it's, also, it's not going to be just for compounds, it's going to relate to things like adjectival resultatives. So I've claimed and given good acquisitional evidence, I think, that children uh, discover that uh, a language like English or Japanese allows things like wipe the table clean uh, most precisely at the point when they discover that they're allowed to invent novel compounds. So there's some questions for both of you. I'll use this. Um, yeah, so I think the question for me was kind of purely an empirical question. Uh, and so one current line of research in my lab is very much to extend uh, this composition work uh, to ask the question to what extent composition inside of works or morphological composition is similar to composition between lexical items. And again, the linguists in the room know that this is very much something that theories differ on. Um, and as part of that research, we have a large scale uh, compound study also that it does include novel compounds uh, as well. And so, I mean, if, if these regions are performing these basic comment or operations, I would certainly expect them to kind of can to gear uh, for those novel compounds if they're uh, uh, presented in a, in, within a task where it's really you know, understood that you're supposed to uh, elicit the compound interpretation. So I, as soon as I have the data, I will let you know. But that's sort of all I have to say at this point. Okay, uh, well, I think I can okay, use this. Um, the, uh, I think you, uh, uh, when your question really uh, connects to the question how many functional categories there are and how pervasive your functional structure is, right? So if you take the traditional view of the functional categories, compounds we don't see much that looks like a, a functional element, but uh, recent views tend to really extend the role of functional elements to a very significant degree. Take, for instance, uh, Alec Marantz and others' uh, view uh, that uh, um, simply the assignment of a category to a root, which is in and of itself, without a category, is done to a functional element, then, you know, uh, you need at least the functional structure that goes with the assignment of categories like nouns, verbs, and so on and so forth. And again, if you think of the tradition that Richie referred to this morning, particularly in the case of verbs, like the Hayden Kaiser tradition, tradition, it's clear that we need more, much more functional structure than, than is, uh, is normally 
soon. So in that case, uh, uh, there is at least hope uh, uh, that it should be possible to account, to express the parameterization differentiating romance and Germanic with respect to the productivity of compounding as a property of the uh, function. Um, this is just a clarification question for Lena. Um, you, one of your slides had um, Chomsky and Merge uh, concatenate from Piotrowski and Hornstein, um, unify from Harholz. And I just wasn't sure whether you were treating them as um, proposals all, that are all similar. So the thing is that um, Chomsky could be right about syntactic um, combination, the way you put syntactic things together just being Merge. Um, and then that underdetermines whether, when it comes to the semantics, the semantics interprets any combination in the same way. For me personally, my commitment is that the people who push lines like concatenate have got to be wrong or else I'm wrong. But I'm completely neutral about whether there could be more to a syntactic combination. Yeah, that was a, uh, it was a, That was, that was a gross lumping of theories uh, just on the basis of having a, a, a unificational aspiration, whether it, it's in the domain of syntax or in the domain of semantics and in a domain that's not so clear in the Hogwarts case. Um, and so, I, yes, I appreciate the clarification question. I, that was just, uh, you know, those are the people who are uh, uh, arguing for unification in some domain or other. But um, the... I think there's still an important empirical question on the table um, with respect to just the issue of whether there is something that is purely syntactic composition that's not also semantic composition. I also have this, this same, you know, initial bias as you do that you know syntactic composition may be very uniform and then there's going to be different semantic roles. Otherwise, it's just really hard to make the machine run. Um, but I think that's still an empirical question. So to the extent that at least in our data have um, uh, sort of suggestions of a unified operation, um, it looks more semantic at this point, and I haven't seen anything that sort of completely merged like, like purely structural or not. You know, so there's a, there's a, the hypothesis phase is, is much richer than what I was able to convey in here. So with respect to the uh, little experiment you presented at the end, um, I, I, I'm just wondering, you kind of didn't go into the, the history of this, but um, Kathy Rishpasik and Roberta Golenkoff did some studies with you know, Big Bird and Cookie Monster a while ago, and they even engaged in a formal debate with Palmasello and so forth, so kind of a two-parter. Um, what did your study you know, sort of add to Kathy and Roberta's work? And if Kathy and Roberta didn't sort of convince people that Tom Sella was wrong, what does your stuff <laughs> add that would convince anyone? You see what I mean? Uh, so I just wanted you to put it in that sort of wider context. Thank you. Yes. Um, actually, it's clear that uh, the, the, the Golinkov and Hirsch Pasek work and uh, that, that tradition is uh, completely uh, presupposed and fundamental for the kind of work that we have done. Actually, they didn't really, well, what we were interested in was uh, uh, the uh, head complement parameter, however it is stated. If it's a merge parameter or a move parameter, as an um, anti-symmetry, it doesn't really matter. But there must be a parameter somewhere, property if you want to use another term, uh, somewhere distinguishing, say, English and Japanese. I mean, it's inevitable. Uh, eat cake, cake eat, there must be some property. So we're interested in that property. And this was not a question that was addressed in uh, the tradition you referred to, because what they showed was um, essentially, but again, exactly the same thing, we just took their technique entirely. So there are two videos, um, two different scenes, and uh, the child hears a sentence, and then you measure the looking time. Uh, but what they showed is that uh, uh, there is a preference to interpret the first nominal as the agent and the second nominal as the patient. Right? So that if you have two scenes with two characters, one being the agent and the other the patient, then children will look more at the video in which the first character that was mentioned uh, would, would perform the action on the other character. But that was completely independent from the headedness business. That, that somehow reflects the fact that uh, 
subjects tend to precede objects in the large majority of languages, right? So that whatever or whatever position the verb would be on, um, children who simply have this uh, preference for interpreting the first nominal as the agent and the second the patient would do it right, independently of headedness. So what we added to that was headedness, essentially. And they also tried um, a condition in which uh, Big Bird and Cookie Monster were a coordinate subject, and they were doing an intransitive action, um, so they're right. both warping or whatever it is they're doing. That's right. And so that does do the transitive intransitive distinction. That's correct. But that's correct. But uh, the difference between uh, uh, our experiment and theirs is that they didn't have any ungrammatical sentence. They didn't okay. have that, that. That's a difference, right? So what we really were interested in is. Uh, does the child differentiate grammatical and grammatical orders depending on the fixation of the headedness parameter? That was the only real difference. With respect to what they did. Uh, the question for Luigi. In terms of this, uh, the cartographic project and the um, very rich inventory of functional elements, um, what's the relationship of those to conceptual structure more generally? I mean, some of those look very much part of a formal system, others don't, like making something prominent in the sense of you know, topical structures, in, the, in, the one, in one sense a very formal property of a structural relation, but in another sense just something about how you communicate information. So what's, how do kids acquire this? How does it relate to other parts of core knowledge, I think is what we call it. This <laughs> well, um, I, I don't really know. I, I really look at the syntax of these uh, properties and I observe that uh, the syntax is largely uniform in a sense, right? It's always a matter of heads that merge with other entities uh, and then the interpretation somehow uses the configuration of thus created for, interpret for expressing interpretive properties. So if this is correct and, and if, particularly if I'm right, in seeing this similarity between uh, argument structure and scope discourse semantics in that they both use the same formal tool, then, okay, we, we can say, well, there, there's a syntax that provides this very simple tool, these tripartite structures, essentially, heads taking specifiers and complements, and thus this uniform entity can be used to express all sorts of meaning distinctions with this big difference between argumental semantics and, uh, uh, and scope discourse semantics correlating with internal merge and external merge. But then within the internal merge, within movement, uh, again, there are big differences because one thing is, are the discourse-related properties that I briefly discussed, topic, comment, focus, presupposition, and other things are the operator, uh, domain of the operator, uh, relations, right? So there, there's a variety of meaning properties that are expressed if this story is correct through fundamentally uniform formal devices. That that's basically what uh, what I have to say about that. I, I don't see any. So that's a fixed list that UG <coughs> provides you, and it might be quite large. Maybe it's a couple of hundred or something like that. Yeah. And that it's simply a listing of functional elements get those for free on this story. Yeah, yeah, essentially. Yes, um, I have a question which might be related. Um, about compounds and functional elements, right? There are these uh, compound-like elements which are subordinated conjunctions, even though, kind of, which are formed by functional heads and that have the properties of uh, have compound-like properties, like one stress, partial compositionality, and things that would fall into this uh, kind of uh, assignment of uh, step and comp kind of property, which would fit into this uh, model of interpreting higher order functional complex entities. More. And then if you look at lower ones, like the compounds, uh, adjectives are functional. Sorry, if you have an adjective in a compound, it's right there, something functional that you have. And then there are language which have like French and 
on the Romance languages which might not exactly fit into the English type of compounds, but show over preposition, like prêt à porter and things like that. We still have only one stress and partial compositionality, so on and so forth. So it seemed interesting to think that even if you don't see the functionality there's in some cases, there might be reason independent to think that at the lower level of compounding, there is still this functional element. And the last comment about the conjunctivist interpretation, I mean, you have to say something more about the interpretation of quantifier, right? Don't get that for free with the conjunction. No, no, I, I, I fully agree with the, particularly the, 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 the first comment you made, I fully agree, the sense it directly yes. re relates uh, uh, to Bill's question, right? So that there's more functional structure than meets the eye in the sense you, you're suggesting kind of evidence, uh, uh, additional evidence for, for that, that sort of functional structure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was also going to say something about compounds, part of which you already said. Um, but I, I think it should be said more explicitly for those not familiar with work in syntax, that it's a, a very common strategy, especially prominent in, in Jingwei's 99 book, is to look around at lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of languages and sort of add up the different functional categories. And then even if um, it's not the case that a given functional category appears visibly in every language, the assumption is that it's there must be there in the language faculty, and that sort of goes with that saying. And I think what, what you said about compounds in uh, French having prepositions is extremely important for the study of compounds because the idea that they're not productive in Romance languages is not at all clear. There are many compounds with different prepositions. Uh, often detected, the fact that they're compounds often detectable by the fact that the second NP has no determiner. Um, and then it's perfectly plausible, although not obviously true, that in English also there's a preposition like functional uh, head. Uh, I had one uh, comment for Luigi. Uh, uh, I thought he was being, uh, it true to form, of course, I, I thought he was being too generous to uh, Neumeyer and people like that uh, when he, uh, <laughs> when he, um, made his proposal about um, for the format of parameters as opposed to the low side of parameters, which is an important distinction that Neumeier, uh, as Luigi says, didn't uh, see uh, at all. Um, but Luigi gave the impression, uh, I think, that Neumeier's um, being ill at ease with there being uh, 170 or more parameters was justified. And that seems to me to be too generous in yeah. my Because the number 170, if you think back to the talk that Jean-Pierre Changeur gave uh, uh, yesterday and the day before, I mean, those are trivial numbers compared to the numbers that biologists work with, that neuroscientists work with. I mean, to say that language has 200 parameters is not to say that it's complicated. That would be rather simple. It only had 200 parameters. Uh, I, I fully agree. I'm sorry I gave the wrong impression. <laughs> 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 Just to, to bear on this uh, issue, I think uh, um, uh, first, my question about the year is about uh, well, the reference you made of uh, Jacob and Mono. Uh, I think it's uh, not at all the same level of uh, organization, and you, you don't anticipate to have exactly the same. I, I'm just wondering whether the analogy is not a little bit misleading, because the, um, uh, the complexity of the system is, uh, is so different that you don't have anticipate to have, for, let's say, no other sample device like this or uh, groups of uh, genes being expressed uh, during the development of the graph search. Uh, one to one relationship, you know, it's true for bacteria, but uh, for higher organ. Now, the, the question I was wondering when you uh, make the comparison between the two possibilities is in fact that uh, it looks as if you have, as I just said, a small number of possibilities 
at a certain stage of development. But um, you might have, uh, as I said, intermediate situation where you have a rather large number of possibilities at each time uh, where you have uh, not a one-to-one -one relationship but let's say some kind of variability is this way and, and then uh, have a mechanism of uh, uh, selection which is associated with the input and <coughs> you may have uh, actually a situation which is uh, in between the two extreme view where the, everything is of course, everything is people have the way. Uh, uh, and it's very uh, hard to imagine that you have a fully instructive effect of, uh, of the environment because you have always a basic instruction at a given stage of the So uh, I was uh, just wondering how you react yourself to this idea, which was actually presented uh, steps, you know, it's, uh, it's not only one stage where, um, as in the, in the early Chomsky philosophy, uh, it was uh, that there is an initial state and, uh, and the end state, and there was uh, just one transition. It's certainly not like that, that the things are happening, because there is a, uh, a multi-step process. Yeah. I think, well, on, 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 on the relevance of uh, uh, Mono and, uh, and uh, uh, Jacob, uh, I'm sure you're right. I was just quoting Chomsky. Mean, he said that a certain abstract level network inspired the principles and parameters. I, I was just uh, referring to, to that. Essentially, for me, it's simply something as big as the fact that in a complex and tightly connected system, if you introduce a little change in one spot, you have systemic consequences. Probably it doesn't, it doesn't go much, much deeper than uh, it is much deeper than that. But in any event, I was just. Uh, That's a good thing because I think uh, you have a way to be not by the structure. Mm -hmm. You have a, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, an alteration of function, and then you have uh, a structure of function relation. Yeah. In the early principles of. Uh, it's not at all um, uh, some kind of uh, uh, formal uh, representation of, of life. It has nothing to do with that, if I may say. But of course, you may derive a formalism from the uh, experimental data which, and, and the constructs which were emerging at that time. Yeah, yeah, well, thanks. I take the point for you. Uh, no, 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 but it's, no, no. it's, a, it's an important point that I actually put these two names just trigger some kind of reaction on that word. Now, I, I wasn't there for uh, Charles' uh, presentation yesterday, unfortunately. Uh, I know what he's only, uh, when you talked about um, the, uh, a system allowing a larger variation, um, uh, in a sense, this reminded me of pre-parametric models in linguistics. Essentially, what you had in such models, I don't know if that relates at all to what uh, Charles said, but uh, essentially you had a rather permissive system that allows you to uh, create lots, in fact, an infinite number of rule systems. And then you had an evaluation measure yes. that somehow helps you choose in this class that can be very, very large, but then the idea was that the evaluation measure would be effective enough to be able to choose. Now the problem is that these models never worked, but maybe there are, there are never varieties. Never worked. Oh, never worked. Never worked formally. Never worked formally. Never worked formally. Never worked
At the formal level, at the formal level. Then the empirical level, uh, it, it remains to be seen, and perhaps we should continue the discussion yes. with Charles uh, <laughs> uh, in, uh, yes. during the conference. But I, I, I wanted to make two historical points and, and then uh, differ with Professor Chargeau. First, Chomsky never claimed that it was instantaneous. He said very specifically, this is an idealization. So it's obvious that children don't acquire language immediately. But let's try, as since, since all theories must make some, some idealizations, let's try that one on for size. So, I mean, Chomsky's not, that one, he's not an idiot. It's, it's clear that children don't instantly get language. But back to this to the histor history of the Jacob, uh, the Monod and, and uh, Jacob thing. So this was this was this this uh, perspective developed in these conversations between Chomsky and the, these uh, meetings, both in France and in, in Massachusetts, that led to the sort of biolinguistic the, to the term biolinguistics that were organized by Massimo Pietro and Marie. So this was an intensive conversation. But I think actually what we know now is even better support for this. So those were the days when all we knew about gene regulation was the, was the lac operon for which they won the Nobel Prize, which is a very simple binary system. What we know today in vertebrates and us, or in eukaryotes in general, is that at least 90% of the DNA does not code for protein coding genes. So there's a vast amount of regulatory material. And in fact, in a sense, this, this supports what, what uh, Professor King was saying. There, there's much more, there's 10 times more regulatory stuff than there is superficial. So this is, I guess we would predict the, the linguistic analogy would be, there's 10 times more unpronounced um, elements in your trees than there are words. So that, that's what, so I think actually history has gotten much better to support this point than it, it hasn't fallen away. You want to go back, no? Other question? Yes. Um, so, following up, more tying back actually to Cox's talk, what would happen? So, this is a general way of asking, a specific way of asking a general question. What would happen if we turned the trees upside down? So, you start off by putting in all the stuff that we think is in the left periphery, topic, focus, and so on. And then you've got to move in order to get to argument structure to determine whether you're the object or the subject. Would there be something about the way that the displacement operation, so, m m Merge by display, displacement by a merge versus just getting together by a merge will be interpreted that will militate against that system. So that's a specific version of the question. The general question is given we've got loads of different functional projections, does that have to be organized in some kind of genetic, you know, down in the genetic material, which strikes me slightly unlikely, or is there some general principle of organization by which we say, well, if this is going to be syntactically represented and this is going to be syntactically represented, you look at the semantic properties of the two things and that's what determines the, the functional structure. Okay, well, there are several questions, really. Um, one is, uh, I mean, is it the case that any imaginable property decoded by a functional element? The answer, presumably, is no. You can imagine all sorts of, uh, I don't know if this works, uh, all sorts of semantic distinctions, perfectly reasonable semantic distinctions, that are not coded through functional, that are not grammaticalized, if you want to use that terminology. So one very important uh, empirical task that the current research has, both kind of linguistics and typological linguistics, I think that really converge in that sort of enterprise, is to identify the class of that are grammaticalized, that correspond to functional structure. That's a very important uh, empirical issue that uh, I think should be clarified, that is being clarified uh, in, uh, in current work. So it's not the case there, as, as far as I can see, in, in every other domain of the language, it's not the case that anything goes. It's not the case that any imaginable property can be expressed. 
Then there's a question, do we have structure? Do we identify structure? Once we have this class of features, right, that uh, grammaticalize properties, do we have structure? Do we have hierarchies that play a role? And then here the, the other part of your question arises. So we observe in functional sequences uh, certain absolutely constant elements and certain variable properties. Like certain things are absolutely constant. Tense is higher than absolute. No, no, no obvious exceptions. Uh, and similarly, for many other such pairs of elements, you see that they are in certain uh, rigid regions. Now, another question arises do these ordering properties, uh, how are, uh, where, where do these ordering properties come from? Right? Is that a primitive property? That seems very, to me, that seems a very unlikely possibility. So I think that this really relates to other properties. There should be further explanations. Or, or, or such properties that could be related to uh, locality constraints, for instance. Klaus Hoppel says, makes this suggestion. Unfortunately, the, the impression is that there's a kind of anti cartographic perspective, but I really don't think it is. It, it really, I mean, suppose that you have a, a further explanation for even all the ordering properties that you observe, still the functional sequence would not be ephemeral be an object of the world, right? Then you have a further explanation. Fine. Many other domains in which you have sequences, you seek for further explanations and you find further explanations so much better. But uh, clearly, it's not that the sequence evaporates. Uh, so that would be one thing. And the other thing would be semantics, for sure. It should be, I, mean, I always thought of uh, Guillermo Cinque's book that Richie mentioned as an excellent uh, list of problems for semantics. If I were a semantic, I would take Chico's book and try to derive from semantic considerations the ordering effects. Perhaps in some cases I would succeed, in other cases I would not. But, but that, that seems to be a real extraordinary problem book for somebody interested in these questions and knowing semantics. That, that's so important. I have a question to Lina. Uh, it has been claimed, and uh, as always, uh, there is some disagreement, uh, that uh, not all language have the same degree of compositionality. Even if it were not true, what is interesting is that. Uh, well, I, I, I'm thinking about polysynthetic languages, for example, where you have a lot of adjuncts. Uh, whatever these adjuncts are, they are even present in languages like French and English. So we, we have parenthetical constructions, we have dislocated constructions, and the like. Uh, did you have, did you find out uh, in your uh, work uh, anything peculiar related to uh, the way uh, these elements are, uh, let's say, composed with other elements. Uh, the obvious reason why I'm asking this question is that I have good reason to believe that in Mutoroku the degree of compositionality is not the same as, let's say, in French. So, for example, number and uh, whatever uh, they modify uh, do not uh, constitute a constituent. There is no compositionality as far as I can see. Do you have any idea about that? Not a constituent syntactically, but they compose semantically. Well, yes, it seems that it's a mm -hmm. So, so the, the, the way this research program got started was specifically, like I briefly mentioned, was specifically by um, looking at constructions that were not transparently compositional. So we started with this well-studied uh, example of complement coercion, where you have, uh, for example, aspectual verbs like begin or finish that sort of semantically select for activities or events, so since they're you know, beginnings or endpoints of events, but are completely uh, grammatical with uh, just a TV complement. So the beginning of all is completely natural, even though it really needs to begin some activity uh, involving the book. 
Um, and so that was the, 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 the starting point. And what we found, found out from that research is that there, the, the venture medial prefrontal, the activity that localizes in this venture medial region, systematically is enhanced for those expressions, but we don't see any other effects in particular. And so, um, and then what we found out later was that exactly that activity seems to reflect potentially semantic composition more generally. So if you have uh, expressions that are non-compositional in the sense that the syntactic structure doesn't transparently give you the semantic interpretation, then according to what I've learned so far on the basis of this research, I would expect those meanings to be resolved uh, by whatever mechanism operates in this ventromedial region. But then you have to kind of look at the details of each example, obviously, to make it, make it more specific. But it was specifically like non-compositional phenomena or just not straightforwardly compositional phenomena were exactly what I thought would be the useful starting point for trying to isolate something that's semantic and not a reflection of some type so composition. Did you see anything special in these sentences like the knowledge of this which is not composition? Uh that study I we sort of have started but had so we do have a study that varies the nature of the adjective. Um, so alleged murder is not a murder. It's not a straightforward intersective uh, uh, interpretation. Um, so again, empirical question. I don't, I don't have the answer to that. But so far, what we've seen is that there's nothing special that happens with, say, type of mismatch or coercion. It just engages the same the same combinatorial machinery that works in other contexts as well. That's sort of the bottom line. Could have been otherwise. In fact, when we got our first set of results, it would have also been interesting if this ventromedial activity was origin related specifically or type mismatch related specifically. That would have been a very interesting finding. It, that didn't turn out to be the case.
because it's conceivable that that is driven by some kind of functional head, but the point is that it does not really seem to have uh, any effect on the BF. And where would that fit in, that in your current worldview? Um, no, actually, I, I believe in a uh, in left movement, so, you know, if you take a language like French, you have uh, où es-tu et tu es où, right? And presumably one will assign very close logical forms to these two structures. In which you have movement, and the other one you don't have movement, uh, and so you need some kind of mechanism to get the appropriate operator variable structure, if that's the right way to express the logical form of such things. So I'm definitely committed to assuming that, uh, um, that there is something common between the two configurations, that there is some kind of marker, so the relevant heads are there. In fact, there is a generalization which holds uh, uh, kind of statistically, uh, even if not strictly, that Lisa Chang looked at in, uh, in her thesis, uh, just to do with the expression of these heads. These, these heads tend to be expressed in the WH movement case, uh, in languages in which you do not have movement, not you know, strictly, because we saw some examples in which uh, this does not happen, but uh, clearly uh, we want to say, if we look at uh, East Asian languages or other languages, we see such interrogative markers that co-occur with WH elements which are seemingly in situ. And the question is where they are exactly, but let's say that, that somehow appear within the IP. Then what has happened to the IP is another question, whether it has moved or not. Okay. So I, I would assume that the same type of mechanism works for WH movement and WH in situ, and that sort of naturally commits me, not, not automatically, but naturally commits me to assume a uh, movement of other kinds uh, through something like uh, a singular mechanism, right? So essentially what would vary would be the visible emerged, the visible internal merge component, but uh, the search operation, the, the relationship between the two elements would, uh, would hold in, uh, in both cases. So I would certainly make that, that assumption. about the dynamics of the recordings that you showed. Um, the, there is a difference which uh, is happening or merging, if I may use the word, uh, after 300 milliseconds in the 300 millisecond to 400 millisecond time scale. That's where the, most of the difference is, uh, is happening. So my first question is, do you have the interpretation? Does it have to do with, um, let's say, some kind of processing, which would be, for instance, more, more conscious or whatever? And second question is um, is modified by attention. If you uh, change um, uh, attention, or if you have some that you see uh, amplification or emission um, of uh, uh, these waves, so that's my question. Um, so, with respect to the temporal dynamics, I'll, can I just ask one old announcement here? Um, the so. What we're seeing is that, um, so let's just say that this, this is zero and that's the onset of a word. Um, so that's 200, that's 400 milliseconds. So the left ATL effect is kind of like that. And then the BMPF C fat is kind of like that. So let me now add other things to this model that I did, didn't tell you about. Um, so we know that uh, around 100 milliseconds, uh, you're doing various types of word form processing that sort of culminates in the definite identification of uh, letter strings at around 170 milliseconds, including morphological decomposition. So if you have a morphologically complex word, word you're going to be detect, you're going to be decomposing it into its uh, constituent visual forms. Um, and now, then, additionally, uh, experiments that vary uh, lexical access by, uh, you know, traditional psycholinguistic variables that are thought to affect lexical access, they most robustly affect activation around 
let's just say 300 milliseconds. So that's the most consistent finding. Um, so now in this kind of picture, um, uh, this is this would be sort of compatible with the idea that you know this this first activity is very much in parallel with lexical activation, maybe even preceding it a little bit. And so that that would be compatible with models that say the syntax comes before semantic interpretation. Just giving you one view of this, I'm not at all committed to that. Um, and then you know so that's sort of happening in parallel with lexical access. And then once you really have sort of crystallized on the lexical meanings of the items, maybe then you're able to do semantic composition. I have lots of questions about whether that's a, the right that right way to think about it, but that's at least one way to spell out the temporal dynamics. With respect to the, the effect of attention, I would expect that if we really, um, so for example, I'm sure some of you have listened to all of this and not really processed it. So it is possible to not really uh, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, deeply uh, semantically process a, 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 a linguistic stimulus. You, you know, it's not that's not so automatic. Um, and so all of us who are teachers know that this happens, right? Um, and so you can definitely tune out, and then I would expect probably a lot of these effects to be smaller or maybe more diminished. Under what circumstances? Well, if you if you change the attention and the effects, selectively in the different contexts. Yeah, this should be more uh, sensitive to that. That's what I was saying. That would be the, the better candidate for that kind of modulation. That's right. about the regulatory sequence, which is, that's what you mentioned, uh, are progressing indeed and uh, uh, create, in fact, a larger number of possibilities than the standard uh, Jacobian system for developing uh, some of the genes together and meeting with them. And um, I, I don't think uh, we are in a situation where there is any kind of limitation of the number of possibilities it may have at different stages of different That's my opinion. At this stage, now um, I don't. Uh, I think your lack of analogy. <laughs> <laughs> I think we may be, uh, if uh, I may say, in a situation which uh, okay. Question for Luigi. Uh, you had a slide which mentioned uh, Anna and Potato, um, but I missed what you said about it. Uh, I just said that uh, they identify about 200 uh, grammaticalization targets, uh, right? And so we could take that uh, as a rough indication of how many functional categories we can have. It means the order of magnitude of hundreds. And then if each of these uh, have, allows for a small number of parameters, we have an idea of the set of parameters that we that I made of, uh, of, their, of their work, just to have an idea of how many functional categories that would be managed. I want to, I, I mean, as a meta comment about you know, a, a terrific meeting, and these two talks illustrate something that's at the foundation of why all of this is very difficult, right? So you saw kind of the best cognitive neuroscience of language and you know, really subtle and granular analysis and then really sophisticated linguistics, let's say the best kind of linguistics. 
and, you, and it shows how far apart they are and how difficult it is to operationalize some of these things and to turn them into experiments that make contact with neurobiology in a meaningful way. And I think you know, two fantastic lectures about the most interesting things one can imagine. And I walk away, actually, as a consumer and producer of this, not actually knowing what I'm going to do next. <laughs> right? And, and the, so I think the challenge for us as a community is to figure out how do we actually formulate linking hypotheses that are more clear about how to translate, let's say, some of the suggestions that Luigi makes and test them with the methodologies and tricks that Lena brings to the table. And I think that, that's where I'm stuck at the moment. I'll have a strong coffee. Well, we'll thank the speakers and the audience.